scientist left in awe by man who qualifies as both a giant and a dwarf. Think of genetics like a roadmap. Scientists can look at anyone's genomes and pretty much figure out where they're headed and how they're going to develop. That's what made a man named Adam Rayner so peculiar, his map didn't make sense. Born in Austria in 1899, Rayner was much shorter than the average baby, and doctors diagnosed him with dwarfism. However, when he got older, he went through a growth spurt unlike anything doctors ever saw before. Something was wrong, and experts had no idea if or when he was going to stop growing. Standing on the left, the tallest man in the world at the end of the 19th century, Adam Rayner. It's almost impossible to believe that just a few years prior, Adam was barely taller than the man on the right, the world's shortest man. How, the experts wonder, did Adam Rayner seem to stop growing and then just start all over again? To better understand such an odd case, the experts dug into Adam's entire life. It was like nothing they'd ever seen. Adam was born in the town of Graz, which was in Austria. His parents were fairly average in height, without any cases of gigantism or dwarfism in the family. So, Adam's parents were shocked to learn their son was going to grow to be well below the average height of a normal child. But, like any parent, they accepted the truth with pride. Because of his mutation, Adam was studied by doctors throughout much of his childhood, ensuring no further abnormalities occurred. Adam lived a relatively normal life until around the First World War. Adam was eager to enlist and fight for his country, but because of his height, he was deemed an ineffectual soldier and denied access. Dejected, he returned home. That's when his feet started to grow. Without growing an inch taller, Adam's shoe size started increasing. His feet grew and grew until he was wearing size 20 shoes. Great, Adam thought. Now he was short and his feet were huge. To put his feet into perspective, Shaquille O'Neal, the enormous 7-foot basketball player, wears a size 23, but Adam was barely 5 feet tall at the time. Once Adam hit 21 years of age, however, everything changed drastically. A growth spurt unlike doctors had ever seen struck Adam like a freight train, and after only one decade, he shot up to just over 7 feet. Nothing made sense doctors. They racked their brains for theories, how was this possible? Doctors assumed there was an issue with Adam's pituitary gland creating excessive amounts of growth hormones and causing acrongaly, a hormonal disorder. Okay, Adam wondered, but what did that mean for him? Would he stop growing? Doctors informed him that this disorder came with other dire side effects. While Adam may not have felt them right away, at some point, they'd set in. They were right. Soon, Adam was suffering. About halfway through the rapid growth spurt, Adam's spine began severely bending causing extreme pain and, interestingly enough, a drastic lack of appetite. Not long after, other senses began to fail also. The vision in his right eye soon began to wane, and he eventually lost all sight. It was only a matter of time before his hearing went. As well, all these issues forced doctors to conclude they needed to operate. On December 2, 1930, a professor named O. Hirsch performed an invasive operation to remove a tumor growing on Adam's pituitary gland. If all went well, they could put a stop to his rampant growth and he could settle into a relatively normal life. Unfortunately, the surgery didn't have the intended effect. Adam stopped growing for a little while, but in a few weeks' time, he was shooting upwards again. Would anything ever change, he wondered. After the operation, Adam was essentially bedridden. His back ached, walked was impossible. His health grew worse and worse until he sadly passed away in 1950 from ongoing problems. After he passed, newspapers approached his life heartlessly. Writers and journalists debated how tall he was in his prime. Did he hold a record? Did he touch eight feet? He became a figure in the eyes of the media, his humanity disregarded. Sadly, this wasn't uncommon for people whose bodies skew so far from the norm. The bizarre case of Phineas Gage is one of history's most infamous examples. However, unlike Adam, Gage was born perfectly ordinary until one accident turned him into an entirely different person. After the change, not even his family or friends could recognize the strange figure that had once been their closest kin, a well-built man admired for his strong work ethic. By his mid-twenty-seconds, Phineas Gage was, was already working as the blasting foreman of his railroad crew. As such, Gage was in charge of clearing rock beds for the laying of track. 
a job he'd virtually mastered over the years. But on September 13, 1848, not even this lifetime of experience could prevent tragedy from striking. While setting a blast to make way for the Rutland and Burlington Railroad south of Cavendish, Vermont, Gage became distracted by a group of fellow rail workers behind him. As he turned his head to speak, his iron tamping rod grazed the stone and sparked. The spark ignited the blast powder, launching the tamping rod like a rocket. Gage tried to duck the oncoming projectile, but it was too late. The rod entered Gage's skull, pierced his brain, and exited his frontal lobe. At the sight of Gage's convulsing body, the other workers were certain he wouldn't survive his injury. Incredibly, Gage was up walking and talking within minutes, and he could even sit upright as he was rushed to a local physician. Dr. Edward H. Williams was the first to see Gage, who the doctor claimed continued to speak regularly even as loose pieces of his brain were removed from the wound. Williams was somewhat optimistic about Gage's recovery, though just a few days later, things took a turn for the worse. On September 23rd, Gage developed an infection, which forced him into a semi-comatose state for the next 10 days. He was subsequently placed into the care of J.M. Harlow, a prominent New England physician whom Williams felt was better suited to tend to Gage's injury. Gage regained consciousness on October 3rd and took his first steps just four days later. But while his intellectual functions seemed to return to normal by the 11th, Harlow noticed something was different about his patient. While the man Gage had been before the accident was described as hardworking, responsible, and a great favorite with the men in his charge, Harlow now perceived him as fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity. It was almost as if Gage had become an entirely different person. After returning to his parents' home in New Hampshire to continue his recovery, rumors of Gage's unusual shift in personality only continued to spread. Evidently, Gage had completely lost his sense of inhibition, saying and doing whatever he pleased and growing irate whenever his wants weren't met. This apparently made it difficult for Gage to find employment during his recovery, so he set out on his own to create a traveling museum of sorts. With his trusty tamping rod in hand, Gage toured the Northeast for the better part of three years, promoting himself as an attraction. Eventually, Gage was offered a long-distance stagecoach job in Chile, which he worked for seven years until his health began to fail. He was taken in by his mother and sister in Santa Clara, California, where, for a brief time, he made a living as a farmer. Gage was soon plagued by frequent epileptic seizures, which only further deteriorated his health and left him unable to hold down a job. After a particularly severe episode, Gage passed away on May 21, 1860, at the age of 36. But while Gage's story of survival is a remarkable one, it was the change in his cognitive function that made his case so noteworthy. Given the dramatic nature of his post-injury personality change, 19th century scientists deduced that the frontal lobe must have something to do with social behavior. In 1994, scientists sought to further reinforce this claim by examining a digital recreation of the rod's path through Gage's skull. According to conclusions drawn by neuroscientist Hannah Damasio, Gage actually suffered injury to both his left and right frontal lobes. However, these conclusions were disproven in 2004, as it was discovered that Damasio and her team had used a model of a cadaver to replicate the injury. Using a 3D reconstruction of Gage's actual exhumed skull, scientists determined that only the left frontal lobe had been damaged. Today, Gage's skull and his infamous tamping rod are on display at Harvard's Warren Anatomical Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. Yet as Gage's story has become a regular point of study among neuroscientists, it turns out that his dramatic personality shift may not have been so dramatic after all. Apparently, the nature of Gage's change in behavior was wildly exaggerated to generate more interest in his case. Later reports showed his personality returned to normal shortly after returning to New Hampshire, which is why he could take on the grueling requirements of the stagecoach job for so many years. So while Gage may not have become a totally different person after the accident, his injury did set the basis for our modern understanding of the functions of the brain. Thanks to Gage, we're that much closer to understanding what really goes on inside our heads. Still, there are medical oddities from the past that doctors are struggling to explain. Back in the 1,700 seconds, Mary Toft was the pet project of many doctors, not for a freak injury, but rather for highly unusual pregnancies. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Mary Toft lived in abject poverty. 
Born in one of the poorest areas of London, Mary was only 17 when she married textile worker Joshua Toft. Her status wasn't exactly elevated by the marriage. Instead, Mary found herself working harder than ever to keep her family, which now included two young children, afloat. She walked two hours each day to work as a laborer, only to return to a hungry family and even more responsibilities at home. Now, none of this can excuse what happened to Mary later on, but it's important to remember when telling her story. After all, it all began with what was back then considered to be a lower class. Poor person tragedy, Mary had a miscarriage. Her backbreaking days likely caused the miscarriage, which occurred frequently among poor women. Mary's doctor brushed it off. In the early 1,700 seconds, 300 years before modern-day medical knowledge, the female reproductive system was a mystery. And mere months later, another mystery developed. Mary randomly started having contractions. Fear of another miscarriage alarmed her family enough to send for the doctor. Mary sweat, screamed, and shuddered with pain as the unexpected labor progressed. When obstetrician John Howard arrived at the Toft House, what he saw would frighten anyone. Mary, in the middle of a seemingly impossible birth. According to Howard, Mary birthed three legs of a cat of a tabby color and one leg of a rabbit. Unfortunately, his description wasn't done yet. The guts were as a cat's and in them were three pieces of the backbone of an eel. By the time Mary's shrieks ended, she had apparently given birth to nine baby rabbits dot 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 all dead. Needless to say, Howard was shocked by what he'd witnessed. A small town doctor, Howard immediately sent word of Mary's situation to England's most revered doctors in hopes of attracting national attention. To his delight, that's exactly what happened. The king found out about Mary and sent Nathaniel St. Andre, a surgeon anatomist, to investigate the claims. With that, one of the pickled fetuses Howard had collected made its way from Mary Toft's humble home all the way to the king. From then on, Mary was shepherded around London by St. Andre. She was poked, prodded, and examined by various doctors. All the while, Mary continued to give birth to rabbits, especially on days when she was to be seen by a large room filled with doctors. It wasn't long before the doctors, who thoroughly examined Mary and the fetuses, noticed some peculiar details about the bunnies. For one, there was no way they were formed in Mary's body. One of the rabbits had grass in its stomach, proof it had once frolicked free. The rabbits also differed in age. Some were newborns while others were at least three months old. Still, St. Andre refused to see these suspicious factors for what they were. He reasoned that the contractions of the labor killed the rabbits and not foul play. The other doctors, however, weren't so easily fooled. They demanded an explanation from Mary and she hurriedly gave them one. She had once been startled by a rabbit which led to her pregnancies. Shockingly, this explanation made sense to some 1,700 seconds era doctors. Back then, a theory called maternal impression was quite common in the medical field. It was a way of explaining birth defects and congenital disorders. For instance, Joseph Merrick, known as the Elephant Man, told a similarly bizarre story to Mary's. Though we now know that Merrick was born with a congenital disorder, it was believed that Merrick's mother was startled by an elephant while pregnant with him, resulting in his elephant-like facial deformity at birth. St. Andre believed this theory wholeheartedly. The other doctors, not so much. Still, Mary was continuously examined by as many as 10 doctors at once, who were disappointed to find that Mary, who suddenly stopped giving birth to rabbits, was actually quite ill. It was around this time that Mary was found out a porter was caught sneaking into Mary's room with a rabbit. He was quick to blame it all on Margaret, Mary's sister-in-law, who, he claimed, asked him to find the smallest rabbit he could catch. Still, Mary refused to admit that it was all a sham, until one of the doctors threatened to perform reproductive surgery if she didn't tell the truth. That did the trick. To the surprise of no one but Saint Andre, Mary confessed to the ruse. So, how did she do it? Again, we'll spare you the truly gory details. The ruse was achieved the way you'd expect. Once in her body, the rabbits didn't have far to travel during the fake birth. So much was a lie. But what wasn't faked was her screaming. Mary really was in excruciating pain, and it's easy to see why. It's astonishing she didn't die of a bacterial infection, historian Karen Harvey said. The rabbits were often concealed for days, even weeks at a time. Toft repeatedly blamed other people, from her husband to her mother-in-law, and even to the wife of a local organ grinder. I think she was just playing the lead role in a performance orchestrated by other people, Harvey said. The papers at the time believed otherwise. 
According to historian Nikki Russell, Mary and her bizarre plight was the media sensation of the year. It certainly helped to tarnish the reputation of doctors as a profession. Unfortunately for her, Mary wasn't just an outcast as a result of the trick. She was charged as a notorious and vile cheat and imprisoned for four months. While in Bridewell Prison, she was basically a sideshow for intrigued passers-by. Her cell faced the public, making her vulnerable to nearly constant torment. She was eventually released without being charged, but found that she never could quite return to her normal life. After all, what does normal mean in Mary's shoes? 